But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Woe to you who are rich. You know, you've already received your stuff. And some people, the only thing they're going to have is uh, they're going to have the things they have now while they're rich. So, you know, maybe they have blueberries. They're going to eat a delicious uh, meal with some blueberries in the mix. Maybe that's all they'll ever have. Maybe I don't have blueberries. I filmed this video before I go eat some Thai food with some people from church, which I'm looking forward to. I used to not like Thai food, but I'm finding slowly finding some things that I enjoy there. What's your favorite, uh, what's your favorite food? As far as American food, pizza is mine. As far as foreign food, um, spaghetti, does that count? Pasta. <laughs> you know, where are you looking for your, your joy? Maybe you think it's in, like, oh, if I just had this job, I would be satisfied. If I just had this relationship, I'd be satisfied. If I just made this much money, or maybe if I was able to travel the world, or whatever. What is it for you? Is it, you think you're going to find it here on the earth? Because Jesus is saying here, you're not. You're not. <laughs> and if you listen to people who have had all the opportunities that you are believing are going to be so satisfying to you, a lot of times they say, oh no, you know, I, I thought it was going to be great here, and now I realize that there's still this hole in my soul. Okay. The both of these guys, they just botched this entire passage. I mean, just keeping it real, this is why the Gentiles, the oracles of God, were never committed to you to teach. Paul said, I wish that some of you were not even teachers, okay? Because you're being too vague. You're not thoroughly breaking down these scriptures, okay? Both of them just stayed in Luke chapter 6, 20 through 24, or Luke chapter 6, 24, okay? They didn't provide any other scriptures as I'm going to do in this video, okay? So let's start out Luke chapter 6, verse 20 through 26. The way that he starts out this video and the way he ends this video is with dry humor and folly. Look, this is not a game. Okay, you don't play around with the scriptures. Okay, because God will judge you for that. Even if your intentions are good. Okay, if you're not called to teach, you shouldn't touch these scriptures. You should be sitting down and learning. Because the way that he taught this, this passage, is the way that I've heard hundreds the preachers teach the same thing, and most of them are wrong. All of them that teach the way that he taught are wrong. Okay, and most of them, just keeping it real, most of them are white theologians. All right? Even these Hebrew Israelite brothers, if they touch this passage, they're not going to teach this the way that these guys taught it. All right? And I'm not going to be as hard on these Hebrew Israelite brothers when it comes to this type of doctrine here. Okay, because they're not wrong about everything. They just need to confess that Jesus Christ is God and that hell is real. All right, let's start out. Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 20. It says, Then he, Christ, lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Okay, this means not just man, a bunch of people, most people casting you out as evil like they're doing P. Diddy right now. Okay, you got a lot of these celebrities and some of these Second class celebrities talking about all my haters and no, nah, that's not what this talking about. It has to be for the son of man's sake, for Christ's sake. Then you are blessed. Verse 23, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Talking about the day the son of man returns. Okay, here is the patience of the saints, as the scripture state. For indeed, your reward is great in heaven. Store up your treasures in heaven, where thieves don't break in and steal, where moth and rust don't destroy, okay? For in like manner, their fathers did to the prophets. Verse 24, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. All right, now let's break this down. When we're talking about rich, there's a difference 
between being rich and being affluent, living the lifestyle, being privileged, and just some man who's been poor all of his life. His mother passed away and he just came into an inheritance. Okay, if that man claims Christ, let me add that. I don't think God holds that type of rich against that man or a man who's earned an honest living and those riches are not his God. Okay, but and this, this is what this guy said pretty much the same, but he didn't break it down. If you just leave it like that, bare like that, you're being vague. Okay, what does it mean to make riches your God? Okay, because... You got to go to these other passages to get a more thorough understanding of what that means. Okay. James chapter five. I'm not going to read the entire passage, but James chapter five, verse one through six, you can read on your own time. That pretty much explains in a nutshell that there were rich oppressors who passed down their wealth, the laborers who mowed their fields. They kept it back by fraud, all right? And these rich oppressors, the scriptures say in James 1 through 6, that passage, that their riches are corrupted, all right? So bookmark that, and let's go to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 12. It says, Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Now we're getting some level of understanding of what he means by woe to you who are rich. Otherwise, you're just applying that passage to every man who's, who's ever been rich, okay? And every man who's ever laughed and every man who's ever been filled with joy, okay, as we go further into Luke 6, 25 and 26, which I'll read later, okay? That's being vague. Here, it's talking about a particular people who built a town with bloodshed and established a city by iniquity. Now, keep it in mind, in Deuteronomy 5, 9, the scripture says, the Lord visits the iniquity of the father onto the children up to the third and fourth generation. All right. So this is for those of you who say, why should I have to pay? For the sins of my forefathers. No, just go and read Deuteronomy 5 9, right? Read Habakkuk 2 12. Okay, the city was established by iniquity. Okay, it was built off of bloodshed. Go back and read the story of Cain. Okay, Cain had to pay the penalty for killing Abel. Okay, read the scriptures that say you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Now, does every rich, evil, rich oppressor? Die by the sword? No. So <laughs> you gotta go look. This, see, see how I'm leading you from one passage to the next passage. This is how you teach this. Okay, you, you gotta go to Proverbs 22:16, which says, "He who oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he who gives to the rich, will surely come to poverty." Okay, now answer this next question. Does every rich man come to poverty? No, matter of fact, very few of them come to poverty. So what is this talking about? Talking about an unrepentant rich man who had corrupt riches. According to James chapter 5, 1 through 6, he died in his sins. Now he comes to poverty. Okay, what's, what's the penultimate poverty here? It's the lake of fire. There's no place that's more impoverished than the eternal lake of fire. Okay. That's the epitome of poverty. All right. So this, again, coming back to Habakkuk 2.12, you have to do your own research and say, who are these people who built a town off of bloodshed and established a city by iniquity? Because if I just said to you, just using a random example, Pookie, who is from the hood, he's moving out there where white folks stay at. Okay. Now, without going to that neighborhood and seeing the conditions of that place, just using your own imagination from your own experience of what you witnessed in this life, you'll know that that's a safe place. That's, that's an affluent neighborhood. Okay. So this is what Christ is speaking about 
when he's talking about the rich, those who built a city on bloodshed, establishing a city by iniquity, building a town on bloodshed. All right. So now that I covered that, let's go to Proverbs 13, 22. Okay. Proverbs 13, 22. It says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Okay. So that inheritance can be the word of God. Matter of fact, I believe this is what it's talking about, the word of God, because the scriptures say, teach it to your children, teach it to your children. Okay. Meditate on the word of God day and night. Talk about it in thine household, post it up on your doorposts. All right. I don't have a scripture for that, but go and research it yourself. This is the hair inheritance that it's talking about because false prophets say that this is money, that there is nothing wrong with leaving a financial inheritance to your children. But let's look at what it says next. But the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. All right. Now you're getting more insight into what Christ meant in Luke 6, 24, what James meant in chapter five, James five, one through six. Okay. Cause I got you Habakkuk also Habakkuk two twelve. So now let's read the story of the rich man and Lazarus, which I'm sure most of you have heard about. Okay. We go on to Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31. It's, it says verse 19, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate. Verse 21, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Now, <laughs> see, the scriptures are cryptic because there's a scripture that say even the dog eat the crumbs from the master's table. This, this man, Lazarus here, the dogs licked his wounds. You see that? So God has a sense of humor when judging these foul, wicked servants of hell. Okay. He has a sense of humor of recompense. The scriptures say repay them double in the book of Revelation. All right. So Lazarus desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from this rich man's table. Okay, okay, continuing on, it says, Moreover, the dogs came and licked his wounds and licked his sores. Okay, if you don't tie these scriptures together, the dogs eat the crumbs, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. This is talking about the Gentiles, okay, because they get their wealth in this life. But in that next kingdom, they're going to have to serve. They're going to have to serve. They're going to be the dogs who eat the crumbs from the master's table. Jacob is the master. Okay, the 12 tribes of Israel are established on the throne of the king of Judah, the king of kings in the new Jerusalem. The gates of the city has the 12 tribes of Israel name written on them. Okay, so there's a pecking order to the kingdom of God. The Gentiles are going to have to be servants. Okay, the same way our people live in the hood and live in the ghettos in this life. Okay, this is what Luke chapter six meant. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit, but you who are full. Okay, now everyone's had a full stomach at some point in their life. Okay, so if that's referring to everyone who's had a full stomach, we're all in trouble, but that's not what it's referring to. Okay, you got to break these scriptures down. And these guys, they didn't do that. They're not teachers sent by God. Okay, they're just following what everyone else teach, especially the people who look like them. Let's continue. Verse 22. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Okay, so he went to a safe place. All right, he went to paradise. Okay, the scriptures don't say nothing about his doctrine he believed in. See, you got to remember the scriptures also say that the Most High will have mercy on whom he please. Okay, it didn't say nothing about Lazarus keeping the commandments. And although you must keep the commandments, let me clear that up. 
I'm not saying that you sit here consciously and say just because you're broke and okay, so therefore the kingdom of God belongs to you. No, because Christ said in one passage, do not think that because these sinners are worse than you, that but unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Okay, so there's a lot of black folks who are poor, they broke, okay, but they bound by the devices of the enemy. Okay, they got a spirit of offense on them. They have this contentious spirit. They want to come here and debate you about whether or not Jesus Christ is God. If you do not believe Jesus Christ is God, it don't matter if you're rich, poor, middle class, you are going to the lake of fire. All right. Okay, continuing on, it says, the rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, Abraham was a very wealthy man <laughs> in this life. Okay, so how did Abraham make it to the kingdom? Well, let's break that down. Abraham, this is for those of you who use Abraham and King Solomon and all these guys, first of all, King Solomon was given riches by the Most High. How many of you will be able to confirm that the Most High came to you in the vision and said, because you did not ask for the life of your enemies, you did not ask for riches, you did not ask for this, you did not ask for that to fill your belly. Okay, therefore, I'm going to bless you with this. King Solomon was blessed with many wives and concubines because of his father, David. Okay, I had someone come in the comments arguing with me about talking about David didn't make it into the kingdom. This is the type of foolish stuff the devil is deceiving people to believe. Okay, the whole world lieth in the hand of the enemy. Of Satan. But going back to Abraham, God tested Abraham. We know that he tested him with his, his son, Isaac. Okay. And it's not like a, there's no way that Abraham could outsmart God and con God into saying, oh, I'm going to go offer my son, knowing that God was going to tell him, no, stop, send the angel to stop him from sacrificing Isaac. Okay, there's no way that Abraham can outsmart God. So he didn't have access to that information beforehand. He was going to go sacrifice his son, show the Most High that he's more important to him than even his offspring. Okay, so how much more the riches, the riches were not important to Abraham. Okay, if I'll add to that, if you read in the Apocrypha in the book of Jasher, Satan deceived Abraham's wife and he murdered her through deception, okay, because she was on her way to check on her son, Isaac. So not only did Abraham, was he willing to sacrifice his son, Isaac, but also in the midst of doing that, he lost his wife, Sarah, okay? And also, it talks about during the days of Nimrod, Abraham chose the Most High over his father. He confronted his father about his idols and his father sacrificed him to the government of Nimrod and they burned Abraham alive, but the Most High came to his rescue, okay? And the fire didn't consume Abraham. But these false prophets will never talk to you about that because they just want your money. So continuing on, says the rich man also died and was buried and being in torments, verse 23, and being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Verse 24, then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. So why was he asking for water? <laughs> he was asking for water because he saw Lazarus drinking from the river of life. <laughs> Lazarus was there to torment him. See, you got to break these things down. What is Abraham and Lazarus doing 
showing he, he already know the rich man is in hell. Why are they showing up there? See, when the scriptures say vengeance is mine, says the Lord, you got to remember the scriptures say, but we shall be like him and see him as he is. So us being the saints of God, if you're blessed to make it into his kingdom, you're going to get vengeance on your oppressors in the next life. But you got to forgive in this life because he's he's forgiving you and spared you the vengeance that he would execute on you. OK, but in this particular passage right here, Lazarus is there to torment the rich man. He was laughing at him, mocking him drinking water in front of him, knowing that this man is dying of thirst, perpetual death of thirst for all eternity. So continuing on, he says, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things and likewise, Lazarus, evil things. So he's breaking down why the rich man is tormented. He's being repaid double, well, really more than double because, I mean, hell is eternity, okay? There's no coming out of hell. I mean, Lazarus only had to spend X amount of years on earth being tormented by him, but that just goes to show you how the Most High operates, okay? Your 50 years on earth, 70 years of earth for sin on this life, does the crime meet the punishment, measure up with the crime? That's not how God operates. Okay, because we're eternal beings. So says verse 25, but Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime, you received good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. Verse 26, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. Okay, now. Be mindful that the scriptures say that those who go to the eternal lake of fire are tormented before the most high and his holy angels. All right. So I believe the saints, although they are in the kingdom of God, they're able to see through this gulf that's fixed or maybe the gulf was broken. That seal was broken because the scriptures say that hell hath enlarged herself. Okay. A part of the torment is, is those somehow the Most High is going to break that veil or the veil was already broken at this point when Lazarus was in hell, where those who are in torment are able to see those who are in everlasting peace for all eternity. I mean, y'all don't know God. Those who teach like these guys and just be vague with the gospel, just playing around cracking all of these corny jokes and all this dry humor, not being serious with the word of God. You don't know God. So continuing on, it says, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Verse 27, then he said, I beg you, therefore, father, that you would send him to my father's house then he just goes on to say how he can return back to his family. No, once you go into the lake of fire, that's it. Okay, now I do believe there are those who have visions. God take them in a vision because he did say that in his last in these last days, he'll pour out his spirit on all flesh. Okay, so I do believe that God gives the Jews and the Gentiles visions of hell because the scriptures say he gives us visions to keep our soul back from the pit. So a lot of people who are uploading videos talking about they went to hell, I believe them, most of them, okay? But there's a difference between a vision and actually being there for all eternity, okay? But I don't have too much time to get into that. Let's go to the story of the rich young ruler, Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 through 22. Okay, so verse 16, it says, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? 
No one is good but one. That is God. See, now, some people take this as Jesus Christ is not God. No, the scriptures say he humbled himself through obedience, through the things that he sacrificed. Okay, what did he sacrifice? He sacrificed his glory. Okay, his godly attributes, the things that made him God so that he can sacrifice himself for us. The scriptures say that Christ became a curse for, for our sake. The church was purchased with the blood of Christ. That does not mean that he is not God. Okay, knowing that he became a curse, that's why he said there is not one that is good, but God. God the Father. All right, but that does not mean Jesus Christ is not God. He was separated from himself to become a curse for our sake. All right. Continuing says, but if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Verse 18. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your mother and your father, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 20, the young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Now going back to verse 19, the end of verse 19, love your neighbor as yourself. Christ said that intentionally, understanding that if the rich young ruler mindful, the rich, young ruler. He was young, rich with power. Okay. Mindful that if he were truly to love his neighbor as himself, then he's going to do what Christ is going to ask him forthcoming. Okay. So verse 20, the young man said to him, all these things I've kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. There go your love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, there go your Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 12. Okay, there go your Luke chapter 6 verse 24. If you love your neighbor as you love yourself, then you will go sell everything you own and give it to the poor because according to James 5, 1 through 6, your riches are corrupted, okay? If you don't do so, then it's the judgment of Luke 6, 24. Woe to you who are rich, death to you who are rich, corrupted with riches, all right? But I want to emphasize that it's not only going and selling everything you own and give it to the poor because he concludes saying, and you must come and follow me. This is why scriptures say broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. All right. Wrapping it up, he says, verse 22, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Let's go back to Luke chapter 6, verse 25 and 26, then we'll be done for this teaching. So Christ says, verse 25, Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now. Everyone has laughed at some point. Okay, this is not mean literally. This is talking about a people who don't want for anything. In this life, he's saying you have your reward. Okay, I've already broken all of that down thus far in this teacher. Okay, verse 26. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Okay, in Christ's day, it wasn't as much about celebrity as it is about the false prophets. The Pharisees were like false prophets slash celebrities back in the day of Christ because they had domain over the temple. Okay, and they was charging a temple tax. And then they was also faking like they were praying and just doing all types of wickedness, fasting so that people could see their face ashened and they wanted the praise of men. 
like many of these YouTubers these days. Okay, and they also want your money. All right. Listen, guys, it's incredibly difficult to inherit the kingdom of God. And I don't want to just put this off on the rich because there are more deeper things like the 17 works of the flesh, the inner workings of the heart. Okay, that's mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, 16 through 26. Paul broke that down. All right, that's a whole nother teaching. Okay, the thing that got me right was Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 15, which says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Follow that up with saying in verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. All right? That's the scripture that made me give my life to Christ. And so should you. Don't let your flesh write checks that your soul cannot cash in the afterlife. It's all about fates and gates. You've got to have faith and you're going to need God's grace. Thank you.